Okay. Um, thank you all for uh, for uh, indulging our new technical luxury here. We're, um, we're we're testing all this new equipment, so I, we're we're hoping it hoping it works. So thank you, thank you for um, for uh, in advance. If there are any any technical issues, thank you for your indulgence. Um, my name is Ashley Thompson. I am a professor of Southeast Asian Art in the Department of the History of Art and Archaeology um, in the School of Arts here at SOAS. I'm also the chair of the Research and Publication Divisions, Division of the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program known as SAP. Um, so it is really my pleasure to welcome all of you here today to our workshop, which is called Decolonizing the History of Art and Archaeology, on publishing cultures in Southeast Asia and beyond. I wanted to, um, to open today's proceedings with a very brief glimpse of Angkor. As many of you know, Angkor is the empire which covered much of mainland Southeast Asia from the 9th to the 13th centuries. Angkor was a core polity of what is often termed the Sanskrit cosmopolis, that is a cultural expanse that was built through the interactions um, over the course of more than a millennium of local cultures across South and Southeast Asia with the Sanskritic culture um, of what we often refer to as India. Uh, Angkor, with its capital in what is now Siem Reap province in northern Cambodia, was the product, very much the product, of the evolving interactions between the local Khmer constructs and cosmopolitan Sanskritic constructs. In linguistic terms, Angkor was built through bilingual literary production with a notable distribution of tasks on the one side and on the other. So the Khmer language can be called and has been called a constative language, that is a documentary or a contentual language um, in this context. That is, it was a language that was used to document data and always in prose form. Khmer language inscriptions record in a prosaic manner the work of kings and their courts, notably the foundation of temples and their administrative organization, providing, for example, lists of servants that were assigned to a given temple, to a given temple uh, giving information on the demarcation of land associated with temples, this sort of thing. So the Khmer language inscriptions often served a cadastral function, a legal cadastral function. Sanskrit, on the other hand, this language of the gods, as it is self-termed, as it calls itself, um, served to elevate the prosaic in poetic form and in a performative or a workly manner, as it has been termed with reference to Heideggerian categories. The Sanskrit inscriptions of Cambodia are complex literary texts. They have codified patterns of rhyme, rhythm, and wordplay. They treat the same materials that are recorded and, and the same materials and the same events that are recorded in the Khmer language texts, but they render these same events through an elaborate intellectual confection, um, which qualifies most obviously as art. So this linguistic union of documentary, vernacular, Khmer, cosmo Khmer on the one hand, and the artful, intellectual Sanskrit on the other, is what can be said to have created Angkor. This linguistic union of the local and the cosmopolitan is variously manifest also in the sculptural and architectural traditions of Angkor. My prime example, with which many of you are familiar, is the sculptural ensemble of the Linga and the Yoni, the phallic symbol of Shiva representing the cosmopolitan order, united with the Yoni, the feminine counterpart to the masculine figure, uh, the Yoni representing the ground. So the phallus, in no uncertain terms, is the sublimated penis, that is the thoroughly theoretical manifestation of power based on the channeling of sexual energy into intellectual accomplishment. The yoni, on the other hand, is the thoroughly uncultured, unsublimated ground. Uh, it is often referred to as the empirical matrix. Again, these are the creations of Angkor, and they are very much what can be said to have at the same time created Angkor. 
So you will no doubt have noted that the binding of the local and the cosmopolitan is not accomplished without the establishment of and the maintaining, the strict maintaining of hierarchies, the distribution of labor underpinning the creation of the cosmopolitan order, variously evidenced in ancient Khmer Sanskrit textual production and in the example of the ancient Khmer Linga Yoni Ensemble, is also about power. The work of art that Angkor Wat's the magnificently intertwined linguistic, sculptural, and architectural work of art was also a remarkable establishment of the balance of power by which the cosmopolitan elite dominated in making abstract and in making so legible to a broader world the local genius. Scholars of Encore struggle still to hear the voice of the people behind the voice of the cosmopolitan elite we struggle still to detect the local hand. Fast track to today, and I wonder if you might tell me that times have changed. All of us Southeast Asianists will, I think, recognize a tendency to posit the local vernacular writing on ancient Southeast Asian art and archeology span on the side of the empirical. We have site reports, short descriptive documents, inventories, etc. I exaggerate only slightly while European language scholarship is on the side of analysis, abstracting from the empirical data to interpret and make legible to a broader world. So what does this say about power relations maintaining the global order in our discipline? What does it say about partnerships in the field? When and how might this change? What is our role? What are our responsibilities as scholars in the power plays today? What effects will shifts in knowledge production have on knowledge itself? I hope that in opening these concerns at the heart of the Southeast Asian art academic program onto dialogue with our neighbors in the Department of the History of Art and Archaeology and beyond at SOAS, we can fruitfully explore other historical and possibly even future models. So with joint support from the Southeast Asian art academic program, and the Department of History of Art and Archaeology at SOAS, today's workshop has an explicitly decolonizing aim to refine extant strategies for facilitating recognition of the many sites of knowledge production in the field and for enhancing intra-regional as well as international dialogue. As an a priori in conceiving this workshop, we have posited that publishing strategies which seek to foster collaboration and diversity at once can open paths for ensuring quality of scholarship without privileging any singular hegemonic voice. So I want to quote from the SOAS Decolonizing Toolkit to situate today's work within the broader SOAS institutional context. And I'm quoting here, Decolonization connects contemporary racialized disadvantages with wider historical processes of colonialism and seeks to expose and transform them through forms of collective reflection and action. Global histories of Western domination have had the effect of limiting what counts as authoritative knowledge. The global domination of written English as the central shared language for academic communication is a significant factor in producing inequalities in the access to and production of academic knowledge. So this is the larger institutional context in which we are evolving with this work. Now the core program today will comprise case studies from Southeast Asia pertaining to publishing cultures and patterns of knowledge production and dissemination in the ancient to pre-modern Southeast Asian Buddhist and Hindu archaeological, art historical, and heritage fields. We have other case studies which will include reflections on similar issues in the fields of Chinese and Islamic art, along with presentations of ongoing, initial, uh, ongoing institutional initiatives at SOAS and the Association for Asian Studies. Um, in closing and then opening, uh, let me thank the people in the institutions who have made today's gathering of minds possible. Firstly, my co-organizers, Udamlak Puntakun and Heidi Tan, along with administrators of the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program, Liam Roberts and Chloe Osborne, who are still working outside. Next, let me thank our funders, 
This workshop benefits from the generous support of the SOAS Southeast Asian Art Academic Program, funded by the Alpha Wood Foundation, and from the Department of History of Art and Archaeology at SOAS's School of Arts. So thanks to these people and these funders, we are delighted to invite all of you, not only to today's proceedings, but also to a reception following them, following them at 6.30, right outside the store in the foyer. Um, I would like now to introduce uh, one of my co-hosts, Udam Natkuntokun, who is a PhD candidate in History of Art and Archaeology uh, here at SOAS. And uh, Udam Lok will be introducing our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley. So, um, our first speaker today is Noel Hidako-chan. I first met him last year at the conference in Tamasa. So that time we have uh, um, we have uh, attended the same theme, like decolonizing history of art and archaeology, and then uh, like we share some experience. Like even he work in the prehistory, but like they have we have some of the common. Um, decolonizing theme in the publishing cultures, so that's why we invited him to share his experience today with us, and we hope that we can uh, have a further discuss and further collaboratory project in the future. So, uh, Noel Hidakotan is a senior specialist in archaeology at the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts, or you know as Samuel Spafa in Bangkok where he oversees the culture's programs related to Southeast Asian archaeology and the SPAFA journal. Born in Singapore, Noel obtained his MA in archaeology from University of Sang Malaysia and his PhD from the Australian National University. His research specialty is in the rock art of Southeast Asia and he has documented sites across the region. Noel also runs the Southeast Asian Archaeology News Blog. And now, uh, please welcome Noel for his presentation. Southeast Asia or just a country within Southeast Asia? 
Um, and I was trying to get to what were the main textbooks about uh, archaeology in Southeast Asia, because we don't really have like primary textbooks or, or, or readers in Southeast Asian archaeology. Uh, the results are online. If you want to take a look at it, you can you can see it online on the website. But we had uh, 58 books suggested from 43 participants, uh, friends mostly. Uh, more than half were Southeast Asian, so I think it's quite representative. Out of the out of the 58 books, only nine were non-English books: uh, Vietnamese, Malaysian, and one uh, Malay and one French book. So the, the ratio is about six to one. Uh, six English books to one non-English book. And not, that got me thinking. How, how, if I were a Southeast Asian, like, like well, in Singapore I'm sort of religious, but if I didn't understand English, how much of my ability to understand the archaeology of Southeast Asia uh, is curtailed? And, and, I was trying to understand, well, what's my, what's my sources? And um, I think some of you already know uh, part of the story. Like there's a story of archaeology that is in English, and there's a story of archaeology that's in Thai, or Khmer, or Malay. And sometimes these stories don't match. And where they don't match, what are the differences? Are they the same? Or uh, what's, what's the differences over there? So that's what I call the general problem. We have two audiences to these two stories of archaeology. One mainly in English, and one the non-English. I'm sorry that I can't the non-English. I mean, there should be many other audiences, but they are basically the English and the non-English. And that includes uh, most of the local Southeast Asian uh, languages. It also includes um, the other colonial languages, French, Dutch, uh, German, but uh, no longer international language. Uh, the difference is that there's a lot more that's written in English than it is in non-English. So from the, from the informal survey that I had, it was 61. There's, there's been very little studies done about this um, disparity, but the only, the only paper that I could find was about the differences in in uh, literature for nature conservation, and theirs was two to one, which I thought was a bit uh, low. And the other problem is that these bodies of text they don't talk to each other. So if you if you wrote or if you do anything in, in one language in Malay or in Thai, this you have no interaction with anything that's in English, and vice versa too. Unless you were effectively bilingual and you could you could read both at the same time. I can't, I'm not, I'm not writing, uh, I, I can't, I can't be writing through like this. And as a result, uh, you have a very different idea of the archaeology. So, the data is the same, but if you have a, a limited uh, amount of data to read from, you have a different uh, impression of what the archaeology is. So that's the tool problem in, in a nutshell. Uh, sometimes the next time we can come quite real. So this is a book published by UKM. Uh, anyone from Malaysia? Let's see. Can anyone? What does this? What's the title? What's it? The origin of Malays. The Sunda. In Sunda. In the Sunda land. In the Sunda continent. Uh, have you read this book? Have you read this book? Has anybody, uh, does anybody know about this book? It's published by the it's published by the University Press of Malaysia, and it claims among other things that uh, the Malay as a race came from Atlantis. This is the University Press, okay, by the way, uh, and that the, the Malay genes uh, are the second oldest in the world. And if anyone who knows anything about genetics will tell you that that statement does not even compete. There's no such thing as all these genes. But this, this, uh, this theory has been out for the last eight years now. The authors have been given seminars. And you know, Malaysia has its own um, problem with the ethno-nationalistic uh, identity. 
this doesn't help, but they're using archaeology as a way to uh, prop up this idea that uh, some genes can be older and therefore more worthy than others. Uh, and, and one of the main sources of information for this theory is apparently from the Human Genome Project. At least that's, that's what they say. Until last year when members of the Human Genome Project finally got rid of what was happening, and they said, no, 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 you're reading our research wrong. There's no such thing as old genes. But, you know, eight years has passed. There's a substantial amount of uh, people in Malaysia who believe that their, their genes are, are older, that they are the origins of the Greeks, that they are the origins of the Chinese, and I'm not kidding. It sounds ridiculous, and I'm not kidding. And this is, this is what happens when the two bodies of research can talk to each other. Some, uh, some real misunderstandings can happen. Um, there's also classifications of um, accessibility. On the one hand, you have the English International uh, Online and Accessible Publications. Um, and accessibility is a, a subjective term. Uh, for example, let's see. you have the BIPA or the, the JIPA now. It's open access, it's free online, you can download it. But it's a bit more accessible than, say, uh, these two journals, these two journals which are behind paywalls, in, in some sense or the other. Uh, all these four are online. These two are print publications, so, and they're not cheap. This one I checked on Amazon yesterday was selling for 125 pounds. So the cheapest and the most expensive are 250 pounds. So even though the research is there, it's not as if, you know, if you have 250 pounds to spare, I think you like to be And all these are in English. So again, if English is not your first language, uh, which means for most Southeast Asians, this research is not accessible to them. So for the amount of research that's produced, uh, a lot of Southeast Asians cannot access uh, the archaeological knowledge of their past. Um, this, is, this is what I do as an archaeologist in my regular time. I specialize in rock art, um, which can span from uh, the prehistoric period, these are hand samples from Sulawesi, about 40,000 years. Uh, these are rock carvings from Cambodia, 10th century. Uh, yeah, so there's a Buddhist component in there. A Hindu Buddhist component. Uh, and then there are also, this is Pao graffiti from the Shan State, about 150 years old. Uh, a lot of people don't think graffiti, a lot of people don't think graffiti and carvings or rock art. But they are, they are basically markings on natural landscape. So I am, I am interested in all of them. But I think everyone thinks of this as the, the sexy part of rock art. Um, if you were to look maybe 20 or 30 years ago, you would think that um, there was no rock art in South East Asia. So there weren't very many, there are, there's not much any books about South East Asian rock art. So the few, few book mentions you have about rock art aren't very uh, compelling. In 1987, Sparta had a conference on the prehistory of uh, Southeast Asia, and there was uh, an announcement of rock art sites in Thailand. There were some presentations made, and then they added the, con uh, the conference and said, oh yeah, there are rock art, there's something in the areas, but uh, the region hasn't delivered any uh, rock paintings. In 2001, uh, this, this is kind of like the, the textbook for, for rock art studies. It's about this thick. You could kill a person with it. Um, and the, all, of all that, the information about Southeast Asian rock art takes three pages and it comes under a chapter of Asia. So that's how the third rock art was known in 2001. In 2002, the book by uh, Jean Fort, who's a world famous rock art researcher, 
uh, has one page representing the whole of South East Asia. Uh, it's hence and so from And uh, this book by Zaba uh, and Bowen, which is meant to be a textbook for uh, Southeast Asian uh, archaeology, mentions that, oh yes, there is water in Southeast Asia, but not a lot across the region. So this is another book called Warlock Art by Emmanuel Nazi, 1991, and this is the map of all the rock art sites in Southeast Asia. So what's wrong with it? <laughs> Southeast Asia, there is no rock art sites in Southeast Asia. So you, you know, you imagine when I, when I came to the field, there was a sense that there was no rock art in, in Southeast Asia at all. And I'm not making it up, I didn't Photoshop any dots away, this was what it was. How many rock art sites are there really in Southeast Asia? This is my map of rock art sites in Southeast Asia. 1,500 sites across the region. How did I find these sites? Obviously, we didn't go to every one of them. Probably been to maybe uh, 50. Did you from Bangkok? Yeah, Bangkok. 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 Yeah, uh, they came from grey literature, what we call unpublished site reports, uh, news articles. Uh, you know, rock art is a very visual uh, medium, so when it comes out of a news story, it's quite easy to spot. And so like I said, I don't, I don't read any uh, literature, but rock art is very visual, so it's very easy to spot, so I'm, I'm lucky that way. How many of these are in non-English sources? So remember, but we went back to my uh, poll and I said 6 to 1. For a journal article, it's 10 to 1. So that's even smaller. And there are, there are other gaps in these that we don't see too. So it's not just the non-English non language journals, but there are journals that are out of print or too small to be indexed. Uh, you also have uh, what I call limited edition books. These are books that were produced by, uh, this one was produced by the Indonesian government uh, in 2014. It is a nice thick book that has every rock art site in Indonesia. Very beautiful, but because it's produced by the government, it was given away with gifts, and uh, you can't buy them. So no one has, you can't normally get them unless you know somebody from the government who gave it to you. So, uh, and this, same with this book, although this book is not online, so you can download it and you can explain it. So, so there's this uh, literature out there that, that exists, but you really have to go and find them. It's not like, you know, it's not like Googling, you have to go to a library, you have to go and find somebody who works in this apartment and, and knock down doors to chase down these uh, publications. And, and back to language. Um, studying rock art is a very English-specific uh, field. We have very strict definitions about what rock art is. Basically, rock art is double down, basically man-made markings on, on natural rock surfaces. Uh, and the, in English, the, the rock art terminology um, privileges the, the, the way you make the rock art or anything else. So you have uh, petroglyphs, which are Rock art that you create by removing substance from the rock surface. So carvings, is a uh, Pictograms are rock art that is made with an editing process that is wet. So a painting is a pictogram, and a drawing is a dry process. So you know, a, a charcoal rubbing, that's a drawing. So it's, it's very nuanced that way, and not all languages can touch this. This was from a workshop in Sparta in 2011. 2011. Uh, there was a workshop on rock art studies, and in our activities, we, we had the start of the day, we asked people, okay, this is a rock art term, could you translate this in your own language? And for some of these uh, languages, this is the first time that rock art was ever given a name in a native language. And some of you might know it in certain languages. A lot of these names don't translate to rock art. In Thai, it means cave art. In Malay, it also means cave art. But not all rock art is in case, so it's not, that's not really a true sense of the word, too. 
And then when we got to day two and three, we just broke down because no one else, no one else had an idea of how to translate this term. So we, we abandoned this activity. And then we talk about theoretical papers. That's, that's even harder. These, these papers, I can't even imagine how to translate them into a, a local language. And it's, uh, I, think, I think thinking about theoretical papers and, and critical uh, analysis of papers brings to mind uh, a very Asian notion of uh, a cultural deference to what has been written before. So when we talk about publishing cultures, we also forget that there is a culture behind the publishing. Uh, at least in my experience, in, in, in some Asian cultures, in some, right, well, not in England, uh, there is a deference to what has been written before. And, and this senior person has written this, and therefore this cannot be changed anymore. So, for example, in one of the very first rock art sites that I worked in, um, there was a description here that this might be a tiger. Not really a tiger. Might be. This is a tapir. Although it might be a tapir. Well. And then for 40, 50, and 60 years later, every other paper says, this is a tiger, this is a tapir, this is a dugong, this is a deer. All because some from the deer comes in and says that this was a tiger uh, 50 years ago. And then forever, it will never change. And this is a, a, a cultural thing uh, and that is, that is uh, underestimated, I think. And it can be best summed up in, in, in uh, this experience can be best summed up in a true story. Um, you can't change all opinions because it will be disrespectful to all opinions. And that's something that I, I don't know how to, it's part of a, it's part of a, a, a cultural paradigm that I can't, uh, I can't begin to change by myself. And I don't think it's a problem, but it's a way that we should be aware of how we think of our knowledge. Because that's reflected on how we publish them. So this is the last bit about Waka because I'm not going to touch Waka and I'm not going to put in publishing. These are my two latest papers on uh, Laotian Waka. I'm quite proud of them. Um, it was stuff based on my, my PhD work and I, I had material that was on and I turned into papers. But there are two things wrong with these papers. First, after I've done my field work and written my reports and uh, you know, sent in my report to the law governments and publish them. Uh, the first problem is that uh, up to now, I don't think any law people have read them because I've never been able to have a version produced in law. Uh, the other problem is that these two journals are behind paywalls, so I can't access them unless my other notes. Um, and that's because the academic publishing uh, uh, system is broken. I think we all know that a bit. And SPAFA is, uh, as a publisher, I'm not saying that because SPAFA is also a publisher, and that Elsevier and Springer are my uh, uh, competitors in terms of. We publish publications, we don't make a profit on them, and in fact, we go to our website, you can download most of our publications for free. Uh, we have a journal too. It's a long, an old journal. It started in uh, 1980. But the stuff that I just, uh, I think even in the, the CTS library, in, in, I was very surprised I went to the CTS library in Stanley, and they still have all the old, pristine copies of the stuff that I just, it's amazing. Uh, but we used to publish that four times a year. And then we published three times a year. And then it became two times a year. And then when I came to Safa in 2014, uh, it was one time a year, except uh, even though I came in 2014, this one issue was produced in 2016. And then back 
data to track data team. And so I spent two years trying to redo the Sparkle journal into an online uh, academic journal. And the reason why we have to do the rerun is because all of us are making the Sparkle. And because it took a lot of time to do a print, a lot of time and money to do a print publication. So the old journals were like, more like a magazine than a You have to put it down. You're not a magazine, you're not a Facebook group. Facebook groups and a book, and you know every month. That's a magazine. Um, and we, we had scholarly articles, but we also had a lot of, in the magazine, trade, we call it rough, rough. So we had reviews, we had sample news, we had a lot of uh, photo essays, uh, 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 fashion spreads, we had a couple of issues in fashion spreads. Uh, but now the, the Sparkle Journal had to be an academic journal, we had to have peer review, we had to have uh, editorial policy, and so uh, a lot of it is geared towards research articles, uh, and we're still trying to do the, the soft aspect of the software general by putting short reports and book reviews and multimedia submissions. Uh, although there aren't very many submissions to the general ones, everyone wants to submit a research article because it comes to with their ranking. And the reason we had to revamp it this way is because we all know publish or perish, uh, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, there is a big push for everyone to, to publish in a journal because that's the only way it counts as rankings. So I've seen it in Malaysia, in Indonesia, and in Thailand. Uh, there's a lot of um, pressure to, to publish. You can't publish a book review because it doesn't count. You can't publish uh, an edited book because it doesn't count. A, journal, a, a chapter, a journal, a chapter in an edited book is worth less than a journal article. There are even points for some of these systems. Uh, for some of the postgraduate courses in, in Southeast Asia, it's a requirement uh, for MA and PhD graduates to have uh, a publication before they can graduate, as a requirement to graduate. And that's of course because it just boosts the... It's, it's a way of gaming the system, right? And so, uh, one way to get around this is that, okay, if they have to publish, then our department will just start our own journal. So you can publish in my journal, in my department journal, so that we can say, yes, our graduates have published before. So it's, it's, so we have this proliferation of our journals. And I'm not, I'm not going to say that uh, the journals that are here are those, those types. In fact, uh, a lot of these journals are quite old. Um, all these journals here, though, the Indonesian ones, they've been around for 20 years, but uh, in the last, in the last five years, they've all shifted to, to an open access system uh, precisely because of this Indonesian push uh, to, to publish or not graduate. And it doesn't matter if... Uh, uh, so now once you, once you gain the system that way, everyone thinks, oh no, now, now you can't just publish in a journal, you have to publish in the right journal. So your journal must have an ISI or a Scopus ranking. Uh, so it doesn't matter if the journal of science society is 100 years old and it's been going on forever. It's not ranked on Scopus or it's not an ISI journal, so it's basically worthless. And that's what, ha that's what happens to a lot of uh, new journals because it takes about three to five years to actually get a Scopus ranking. Right? And that's what happens to a lot of uh, old journals who are too small to to be concerned about putting their stuff online. So there is this preference that uh, to be a to be an ISI or Scopus journal, you have to be an international journal, which means almost always it means that you have to be published in English. So there's a preference now that uh, feeds into publishing in an English journal, English language journal that has a uh, ranking and smaller journals uh, get less and less submissions and uh, they have less and less of a reason to continue, which is a shame. But that's the, that's the point, publish in English or perish. That's, the, that's how we are getting to this stage where this two-world problem is exacerbated. So you can see some cracks in the system. The, the current model is unsustainable. Uh, you see how the smaller journals are being created. Now, now 
know if uh, software systems like OJS, it's very easy to, to start your own journal. But because of that, it's very easy for, for predatory journals to, to begin. And I'm sure uh, most of you would have received uh, an invitation to be an editorial board member of an engineering journal or to join a chemical, uh, 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 chemical journal. Um, and these are targeted specifically at the developing world because everyone knows that these are the ones that have to publish in order to keep their jobs. At the same time, there is a backlash against the big publishing uh, companies. So what I'm seeing in Australia, in the EU, there's a requirement now that you have to publish in an open access journal when you're using funded research, which I think, I think is great, but it means that uh, it hasn't, that, that sensibility hasn't reached Southeast Asia yet. It's not going to reach Southeast Asia for another five, maybe even ten years. And then by then, I don't know how the, the publishing landscape will be. Uh, eventually, it will catch up. But uh, in the meantime, the, the, bigger journal, the, the bigger publishers are being pressured to lower the prices, and the smaller journals who are publishing open access are being uh, deluged by, um, by an increasing number of submissions. And after all this, English is still the international language of science. I don't think that's going to change anytime. Um, maybe, except for maybe Chinese, maybe there might be a situation in 40 years, or maybe closer, that everyone speaks Chinese instead of English. I don't know. If, that, if there's a change in language, that might be it. But even in ASEAN, even in Sydney, our official working language is English. So, uh, every now and then, maybe uh, Thailand will say, we should change the language of ASEAN to Thai. And then the media will say, no, 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 we should change the, the, the language to the answer. It will never happen because the English becomes the default neutral ground. So, so that's the equilibrium there. It's, it's very hard to, to get this out of the English paradigm. So you notice that I, I didn't use the column emission. <coughs> Uh, until now, because I didn't really know what decolonization, decolonization really meant in this context. Um, but you can think of uh, colonization as a one-way dialogue. I tell you to do something, and decolonization would be not to remove me telling you something, but to make sure that there's a chance to respond. So you turn it into a conversation rather than I tell you something back, and you tell me something back, and then you continue talking. So what can we do um, in order to, to to address the imbalances? Maybe for governments and institutions like SOAS, um, or grant bodies, Maybe we should start mandating that research should be returned, at least in some form, in a local language. I think I, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a it's too onerous uh, a requirement to require that if a researcher goes to Cambodia and they put in a research report back, they should at least give a summary in Khmer. I don't think that's that's hard if you. If you produce a, a, a thesis in Thai studies, even though if you had an abstract and title in English, it's not hard to do a title and abstract in Thai. If you are a publisher, maybe you can start encouraging uh, publications in two languages. Um, and if it's not feasible, because I know it's hard to pay for translations, so you can make it a requirement to, uh, if you're going to submit a paper, you have to submit a paper uh, with a title in English and an abstract, an uh, 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 abstract and title also in a native language that's relevant to the country you agree. So I, I'm doing this for the Aspafa journal. We started it this year, and we have no negative feedback at all. And if I shouldn't be surprised, because the Indonesian journals that I showed you, they've been doing this for the last 20 years. And they've been doing this time. Uh, so 
sometimes I get requests from them uh, they need help with translating a track or just correcting, correcting a track. And that's not really hard, that's like five minutes of work. So it's not a hard thing to do, but the, the good thing about having these uh, titles and abstracts, uh, especially if they're going to be online, is that they can be searchable uh, in a native language. And that's the whole idea of putting something online, they can be searchable in a native language. But I know not all of us in this room are governments or publishers. So what can we do? So maybe we should also start insisting that we publish our work and we submit something to the journal. Maybe we should say, if I publish with you, you should also include a title and an abstract in a different language. And if they refuse, find a different journal. Um, for people who already have your work published, um, and especially if you put them on websites like Academia EU or in Research Gates, you can also start uh, getting translations done for uh, getting translations done for summaries for your titles and for your abstracts, um, and then put them out online so that other people can access them. So I, I started doing this for one paper, and I'll, uh, if anyone's looking for work, I'm happy to pay. Uh, to, you know, really seriously, it's a true offer. I'll pay, I'll pay in coffee, in meals, and cash <laughs> um, to translate some of my titles and lectures into a lot of languages. Uh, but also, the other thing that you, you should learn is uh, learn a second language. So, like I said before, I can't write in another academic language other than English. And for half of you, uh, whereas English is not your first language, you are writing English in academic level, which means you are far better than I am. And for that I respect you, because I have not yet reached that level. Uh, and you guys are great. So, um, maybe all of us should learn the American, learn the second language. And the last thing is to, uh, probably the most important thing is, continue sharing and collaborating. I've spoken to some of you already before, before this workshop started and I'm, I'm very struck about the, the community that's built here and I, I didn't realize when I came here uh, a few days ago that there were so many places that I would know here and I'm very happy to see all of you uh, but it also means that we should continue talking to each other we should continue sharing because you know when, when all of us go back home to our home countries uh, yes, we had a good time in London. Uh, yes, we remember a good time in Soares. But uh, the things you will miss the most, and I'll tell you, this is from personal experience, the, the, the thing you will miss the most is your interactions with people. The people are the ones that you miss the most. Uh, and they will be the ones that you'll come back to the next time uh, when you meet again, because I'm sure you'll meet again. And you can reminisce on all times. But this is the power of sharing and the, the continuing conversation. So maybe ask your, ask your friends, how is archaeology in, in your language different from archaeology in English? That would be a good starting point. Uh, and with that, thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today uh, I'm uh, going to talk uh, at the role of sorry uh, the role of uh, publishers uh, in the production of knowledge uh, of high art history and ideology. Uh, let me uh, start on my uh, presentation. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the problem of uh, production of uh, art history and ideology knowledge in Thailand doesn't uh, relate uh, to uh, the language uh, barrier and writing cultures only, but uh, media platform or uh, publishers uh, also have an effect on uh, scholars and producing uh, knowledge. Uh, nowadays uh, in Thailand, uh, there are three uh, different uh, platforms of uh, media for publishing uh, art historical and uh, archaeological uh, work uh, in uh, the Thai language. Uh, first, uh, academic uh, journal. Second, uh, publishing uh, company. Uh, third, uh, online uh, press. Uh, in this uh, platform, uh, the style of uh, writing languages and uh, contents are uh, different. Uh, because of their audiences and their uh, standpoints or uh, business point. In Thailand, I uh, publish uh, my works uh, in uh, these uh, three kinds of uh, media or platforms. Uh, however, uh, in the, this uh, seminar, I have uh, only uh, 10 minutes uh, to talk about uh, this, this uh, media. So, uh, I will uh, discuss uh, only uh, the first uh, two media. First of all, uh, Choi, uh, most scholars uh, believe uh, that uh, the first one is more uh, reliable uh, than uh, the second one. But uh, this criterion uh, doesn't work uh, in Thai uh, context uh, because uh, each of them has uh, their own uh, purpose and uh, standpoint. Uh, I can uh, general. Uh, most of, of uh, synagogue school or a Simbagon University or uh, the Fine Art Department uh, in uh, Simbagon, uh, some, I think uh, maybe uh, someone knows, uh, published uh, their works uh, in uh, Simbagon uh, Journal and the Bong Michakan Journal. Uh, the aim of uh, the, aim, uh, of the Simbagon Journal are uh, to publish uh, the Fine Art uh, Department's uh, research and work and to serve uh, national agenda and monarchy. Uh, most uh, writers are uh, the Fine Art Department's uh, uh, staff. Most of the uh, articles uh, in this uh, journal are descriptive, uh, emphasizing a uh, report, uh, the result of uh, excavation, uh, artifact analysis, uh, history uh, of uh, ancient city, uh, and study ancient architectures. While uh, the Blom uh, journal uh, just uh, established in uh, 2002. Uh, this journal uh, mainly served uh, lecturers and students uh, work of uh, Silicon University and other university uh, as well. The Blue Shagan has a peer review system. Uh, this makes uh, it uh, more reliable uh, in terms of academia. Most of them are uh, descriptive. Uh, some of them are analytical and uh, some of uh, them uh, report the result of uh, recent research. These two are uh, published uh, in Thai language. Uh, and this can be published uh, in, in uh, these uh, two journals. But uh, most of the audiences are uh, the Thai. So uh, there is no uh, necessary uh, to publish in English. That is uh, like the reason. Uh, that means uh, the updated uh, art historical and archaeological uh, information or its tools uh, will be limited. Uh, in the Thai language. A few weeks ago, uh, when I uh, was in Thailand in my uh, free work, I had a chance uh, to talk with a young uh, archaeologist in the fine art department. He thought that uh, why he has to publish uh, his work in English. He foreigner uh, uh, art historians and archaeologists uh, want to know uh, updated uh, information about uh, Thai uh, archaeology or uh, art history. They should be uh, able to read uh, the local language. This might show uh, a kind of uh, nationalism, but uh, in fact, uh, it shows that uh, they recognize uh, the problem of the uh, imbalance of uh, the power of uh, language. 
uh, for a publishing company. As I understand and I see, uh, most of uh, the Thai uh, art historians uh, publish uh, their work uh, with Mati Chong uh, Publishing Company and uh, Memorand uh, Journal of Publishing uh, Company. While most of uh, I could just uh, publish uh, their works uh, with a uh, university press and the fine art department. Uh, what we can, it is possible that uh, the language uh, in uh, art historical work is easy to understand uh, for the mass uh, audience uh, rather than an uh, average that uh, sometimes has uh, a lot of uh, number and spec, uh, a statistic, something like that. What is one of Silapa Wadantam magazine? Uh, was established uh, in uh, 1929 uh, by Sujit Wongte, a senior scholar and archaeologist. Uh, the initial aim of uh, Silapa Wadantam magazine was to argue and contest uh, national uh, history and archaeology. Much colonial knowledge and nationalistic uh, works are revised and debated uh, by Sujit and author writers. For example, uh, Sujit uh, argues uh, that uh, Suo Thai was not the first uh, king of, of Thailand, as national uh, history uh, uh, proposed. That means uh, Suo Thai uh, cannot be defined as the first king of uh, in Thai uh, art uh, historical uh, framework. Unfortunately, uh, the knowledge uh, in Manichon has been uh, rarely uh, referred uh, to Western academic uh, works because uh, they published in uh, the Thai language and some of them, or uh, most of them, are published in a new, uh, news uh, paper. In order to uh, communicate uh, with the mass uh, audience, non-academic uh, language and writing culture in the style of uh, uh, columnists are used in Matichon a lot. Moreover, the degree, the degree of uh, academic uh, reference uh, it's very used uh, because it made uh, books uh, look boring to read. Uh, while uh, Memoran was established uh, in uh, 1974, Sisa is uh, the head of uh, the editorial board. Uh, this journal aims to uh, present uh, folklore, local history, local knowledge, and a uh, variety of archaeological and art evidence in uh, many uh, ancient cities in Thailand in order to uh, re uh, the past of Thailand and uh, Southeast Asia. In addition to, in addition to uh, Melbourne, also uh, open a step uh, for uh, alternative or uh, non-mainstream uh, art historical and uh, archaeological uh, knowledge. But uh, one thing that uh, Melbourne uh, is a difference from uh, Madichon is that uh, every uh, article provides uh, an English uh, abstract. That's why uh, this uh, journal is often uh, referred to uh, in this work. Although uh, these two uh, publishing uh, companies have uh, like a common or uh, something uh, different, uh, one of them uh, try to involve uh, with uh, social phenomena and uh, politics. While the uh, academic uh, journal doesn't uh, deal with uh, this uh, problem or those problems. Some uh, scholar of uh, Singapore University and uh, author uh, prefer to uh, publish uh, their work with uh, Madichon and Mumburan because uh, their work uh, will uh, spread uh, widely uh, to public. And uh, this is uh, one of uh, the best ways uh, to uh, educate uh, Thai people. Uh, at the same time, it cannot uh, refuse uh, that uh, the benefit or income or money uh, for company is uh, better uh, than an academic uh, journal. At the beginning of uh, Manichon and uh, Murmuran, uh, proposed alternative uh, knowledge and uh, uh, interpretation, but uh, around uh, uh, for uh, 10 to uh, 15 years, the number of uh, mainstream uh, art history publications uh, have uh, significantly uh, increased. Uh, the products of uh, them are sold to uh, students, uh, general people, uh, to guys, and uh, amateur uh, art historians and archaeologists. This change uh, leads uh, to the business uh, reason. Uh, and audience in Thailand that now 
uh, need to consume uh, mainstream knowledge to serve them that's not stodgy. Uh, in conclusion, uh, in Thailand, there are uh, many platforms uh, or uh, publishers uh, to serve uh, art historical and archaeological works. Each of them uh, has uh, their own uh, nature, writing uh, style, uh, academic issues, and uh, audiences. However, uh, you can see uh, that journal in Thailand serves uh, only uh, a circle of uh, the scholar, while uh, publishing a comedy serves uh, both a scholar and society. Moreover, uh, many uh, issues that are being uh, discussed uh, in, in, in the West, actually, uh, they are being uh, dis discussed uh, in Thailand as well uh, through uh, Madison, especially uh, in Madison. Uh, certainly, uh, sometimes uh, we don't know uh, each other because of that language uh, barrier and uh, writing cultures. However, the point is how to create uh, a new platform uh, for exchanging uh, data, uh, information, and writing culture. Because to uh, that could be uh, uh, the east uh, and the west, like it like should be uh, end. I'm not sure. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, attention. everyone. Thank you for indulging me. I am um, kind of far away. Although I do wish I was there enjoying the, the sunlight kind of filtering in through the glass. So I think Hi. You tell us when you want us to change the... Change the okay. yep. um, hi, I'm Selena. Um, again, thank you for having me. I'm timing it myself as well, so not to worry. I will try to keep to 10 minutes. Uh, today I'm going to share a little bit about the research that I did when I completed my MA in SOAS last year. Um, really, just to start with an overview, uh, I read lots of articles from orientations, and as Ashley mentioned at the introduction, my core question for myself was um, what kind of knowledge is constructed in the pages of orientations? Um, Specifically, I was looking at Southeast Asia, I was looking at Hindu-Buddhist art, and these are all sort of contentious terms that I hope to describe a little bit more, to go into a little bit more detail about what I found out. Um, so first, uh, some background. Orientations is an English magazine published in Hong Kong and distributed worldwide. The target audience is collectors and connoisseurs of Asian art. I mean, they brand themselves right on the cover page as the magazine for collectors and connoisseurs of Asian art. So there we go. Um, for currency, I limited my research to articles published in the last 30 years from 1987 to 2017. And I was looking specifically at articles with um, Southeast Asia or Hindu Buddhist um, in the title. And from there, I kind of pulled out 113 articles, which made specific reference to Southeast Asia or Hindu Buddhist objects. And there were actually, over 30 years, four special issues devoted to Southeast Asian material. Um, and I'm going to start really by telling you what I learned from reading so many articles from orientation. The first is that Southeast Asia and Southeast Asian culture is positioned as a derivative of Indian traditions. Um, and this for me was problematic because Southeast Asia is then denied agency um, and it's really presented just as a receptacle for Indic culture. This very much mirrors the early scholarship about Southeast Asia um, as being kind of Indianized states as Sadis suggested. Southeast Asian materials were also described often as being derived from Indian prototypes um, or compared to Indian iconography. So for example, I read about a Mohan Varabhati standing Buddha 
described as derived from Indian Buddhist sculpture of the Gupta period. Sometimes the references to India were a little bit more subtle. So um, I also read of Cambodian sculptures um, and the garment on the Cambodian sculptures were described as dhoti rather than the Cambodian term of sampot. So little things like that suggest uh, to the reader that Southeast Asia is an extension of India. Why was this the case? Um, I think it's likely because Indian culture is much more widely known or assumed to be more familiar to the readers of the magazine. So references to Indic culture would become almost a kind of shorthand for the writers and for the publishers. And there was no real impetus to refer to Southeast Asia from any other perspective. Um, however, it's not as if this shorthand was applied fairly across other uh, cultures with Buddhist um, Shaivite or Vaishnavite material. So, for example, um, East Asian Buddhist materials were not quite subject to the same essentialism. There was an article about a Chinese Bodhisattva sculpture at the Walters Art Gallery, and it was described for its visual qualities and compared against a contemporary Guan Yin figure in another museum in an attempt to date it. The key here is that the description of the Chinese image represents what can be seen, and the writer felt no need to recontextualize it by comparing it to another image from a different tradition. This was the trend in um, wider academic discourse about Southeast Asia. Orientation has thankfully shifted away from this Indocentrism in more recent years. So um, in 2017, for example, John Clark, he published an article discussing more updated scholarship about a stone dharma chakra, excuse me, a stone dharma chakra from Dravarati in the v &A collection. His article situates the object within wider developments in the region, rather than slipping into an easy Indian references. So in other words, it was simply a good academic article. And I'm hopeful that with more scholarship about Southeast Asia being published from within Southeast Asia and outside, um, orientation will catch up. The second thing I learned from reading a lot of orientations is that Southeast Asian material culture pretty much ended in the 18th century. So the vast majority of articles about Southeast Asian material discuss objects from early civilizations, including Khmer, Sukhothai, Lana, Ayutthaya, the, the so-called classical periods. This reveals to me really that collectors and connoisseurs of Asian art were interested in a particular type of Southeast Asian material or were expecting a certain aesthetic from a certain period. Um, a handful of articles about other types of visual or material culture of Southeast, Asian, uh, of Southeast Asia only ran when they published special editions. So for example, there was a festival of Indonesia which took place in a few American cities from September 1992, the early, early 1992. And there was a special edition of the magazine in December 1991 devoted entirely to the arts of Indonesia. So that covered things like batik. And it stands to reason that if you read only orientations and didn't have a particular interest in Southeast Asia to read beyond what the magazine shows you, you would naturally develop a very narrow understanding of Southeast Asian material culture as being exclusively from a particular period or of a particular aesthetic. And the last um, thing that I learned about Southeast Asia from the magazines is that the entire region is dominated by Hinduism and Buddhism. Of the 113 articles surveyed, not a single one referred to the Islamic art of Southeast Asia. Philippines, as you might know, where Catholicism dominates, is not part of the Southeast Asia imagined by orientations. Um, and the monuments of Borobudur and Angkor Wat seem to trap Southeast Asia as a romantic land of temples, of monks, and some kind of mystique or exoticism. So <clears throat> I think really, if you're a scholar working within Southeast Asia, the boundaries that exist between art, history, anthropology, and archaeology are sometimes difficult to defend. And you cannot quite train to be an art historian of Southeast Asian Hindu Buddhist material in the same way that you can specialize in Greek sculptural tradition or Ming ceramics. Art history is often taught as a linear progression through time, and this may or may not be relevant in Southeast Asia. 
and unlike in the study of Euro-American art history, there isn't a clear separation of religious art from secular art in Southeast Asia. So for example, some scholars of, of contemporary Southeast Asian art often draw on religion to understand the process of art making, even if the content of the work is not itself religious. These relate to the general observation that Southeast Asian art history as a discipline is nascent, but they also reflect the system of knowledge or knowledge making unique to the Southeast Asian context. Um, I like to think about it as a way perhaps of decolonizing knowledge. So what I learned from orientations is that to collectors, Southeast Asian material of greatest interest tended to be sculptural, um, Hindu Buddhist, and classical. So it, orientation does very little to discuss these complex notions of, of knowledge, of aesthetics, of power, of polity, which um, you have to think about, I think, when you're thinking about Southeast Asia. Of course, there's something to be said about the visual appeal of the materials themselves, that they are loved by collectors. They are undeniably beautiful and possibly exotic. There is nothing inherently wrong with that. People want to spend their money on objects that bring them joy, and beautiful objects do that. So then the question I wanted to ask as well was, why collect? Um, and I thought that this quote by Bordeaux helps, to, helps us to think really about the idea of collecting and the practice of collecting. It's very much social. Um, it is very much a, a marker of prestige. Um, so the impulse perhaps to collect Southeast Asian Hindu Buddhist objects can be traced really to the history of the exhibition as an Orientalist pursuit. Um, and some have suggested that interest in South and Southeast Asian objects spiked actually with the, with the founding of the People's Republic of China and Chinese art became illegal to import. Also, compared to South American and African art, Southeast Asian objects were relatively ex inexpensive. And that's why, you know, really, people started to develop a taste for the Southeast Asian material. Um, I'm aware that I'm running out of time, and I really just wanted to end with this last question, that, which is about the ethics of collecting. And when we think about the ethics of collecting and the position of Southeast Asia within the, the greater global context, unfortunately, a lot of Southeast Asian objects, a lot of Southeast Asian nations become the victims of of exploitation by virtue of economic power, etc. And so the place of um, orientations within this larger publishing culture um, as a player within the art market and the ecology of trading art as commodity, just for me, furthers the exploitation. And so if I'm asking myself again what kind of knowledge is constructed in the pages of, of orientation, I'm wondering to what extent should we be asking that same question of other types of publications, of academic journals, of textbooks, um, and with orientations, a magazine that has mass market appeal, does it perhaps have greater power, um, and what does that mean? So I'm sorry that I'm ending with more questions, perhaps, than um, any other kind of information, and I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you very much.
And uh, we have this one about the three national treasures now at the Chan Museum. In this one in Vietnamese. And this also about the all the charm relics in the city uh, again in Vietnamese. Yeah. And uh, last year we have this one uh, by a museum staff, but it's more like a guidebook and it's written in English. This one, uh, this is the seminar book sitting from the conference and it's by New York. And recently we have this one, uh, the catalog that right? we see in stone, but it's uh, in English only, we don't have the Vietnamese audience for the Vietnamese audience. Um, and uh, one other situation is that the museum doesn't publish any bulletin. Yeah. Either in the form of crack copy or electronics, years ago, museum staff contributed papers uh, and excavation report written in French to such a, such a, is, um, a French journal for the study of Chamba art. Um, uh, but uh, now such a has stopped its operation and French speaking staff already retired. So actually now we don't have any. We only have two staff speaking French at the museum. Uh, so what's the problem? Um, uh, I want to highlight some problems here. But the museum, the Char Museum, lacks research material, particularly French books and written documents during the colonial period, uh, as I already mentioned. Yeah. So I can tell you some like this one. The first one, yeah, here. Right. The first two is really important publication, one by Henry Bocmonte and the other by Philip Spann. But at the museum now, we don't have any French version. We only have translated version and another. Uh, but the translated version is in like uh, in the form of like um, how to say uh, we ask museum staff to retype. Yeah. So its quality is really bad. And uh, uh, this book is really important to the study of Chamra because. Inside the book, we also see the illustration or on the map of the site. Yeah, but at the museum, we don't have any books like this, and then we don't have even photographic illustration like this for the study. Yeah, or like this one. Uh, this one not the section that I took photo during my field work at Ether in Paris. So Ether now have a big collection of the written documents uh, uh, during the colonial period. Yeah, but we also don't have it at the Chan Museum today. Yeah, um, and uh, so this one, how about what can the image tell you? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the second problem is museum has limited source of photo of Chamba site and sculpture. Um, I can tell you one example. Like this is one of the uh, drawing uh, by Jean Yves Blais. Uh, he conducted the excavation in Trapeau in 1927 and 1928. This is very important collection Trapeau sculpture at the Chan Museum, and the excavation he says is also very important. But we don't have this kind of drawing or like map at the museum. Like this, this one and this one on these, uh, uh, these all of those are like reproduction that I took from photo archive of the Hebrew Museum in Paris. Yeah, and today because we don't have any photos in this uh, library, so we mainly use the website of Eiffel. But the fact is that. We all not we not quite sure that we have internet connection all the time to get access to the photo online, right? Yeah. And the third problem is the language barriers. So this kind of language barrier prevents museum staff from assessing research materials and publishing their work and their own example. Uh, many museum staff, for example, don't speak English or French, so they find it difficult to read or to use any materials in <coughs> foreign language like English or French. Yeah. And uh, several materials in French have not been translated into Vietnamese. Some have been translated but not commit, and some sections uh, are missing. More seriously, the translated version includes text only without illustration as in original printed books. Uh, it's a real dilemma here, given that the field of ancient Chamarat were originally shaped by the French, but there seems to be a rupture um, 
in the reception and reproduction of knowledge uh, in this field at the Chinese Museum today. And uh, this provides the language barrier and the lack of research materials. Yeah. So another example of language couples is the new scholarship in Shambhara, Art History and Archaeology, is not in English only. But there are no translation into Vietnamese, whereas recent excavation reports, new discoveries, or few surveys are conducted and written in Vietnamese, so that a gap between the two words. Yeah. Yeah. So I can mention some book here, like this one. Uh, you know that this book is really important to study of Shama. This one, yeah, but on the in English. And this one, this journal. Like, this is the only journal of the history of archaeology in Vietnam, but it's written in Vietnamese and, uh, but luckily it's an abstract and title and keywords in English. Yeah. Uh, this is a very good book uh, in understanding charm structure and how the Vietnamese people uh, reset uh, this kind of cultural legacy. It's a very good book to my opinion, but sadly it's written in Vietnamese only. So. If you want to learn about this, we'll set up reception and you don't know how to read it. So is it clear that there exist the three bodies of knowledge written in three nine languages, colonial materials in French, and both colonial materials in English and Vietnamese, with limited use of French and English, in addition to the shortest of the recent <coughs> materials and proper translation work, as I mentioned. Museum staff can't make use of the existing scholarship published by foreign research, um, um, researchers for their work. And with publication in Vietnamese only, the museum staff cannot also deliver their work to non-Vietnamese researchers, and thus hindering non-Vietnamese researchers in assessing data and other updated information in the fields. For, it, uh, for this reason, and to some extent, uh, for commercial use, some staff decided to publish in, in English only. Yeah. In recent years, we have some bilingual publication, and one is funded by Eiffel. It's about the Chamba inscription, and but this <coughs> carried out by Eiffel staff, not Chamba museum staff. So, in conclusion, I I want to say that publishing is something very important for a museum at the center <coughs> for displaying preservation, education, and research. The Chamba museum is an example among many other examples from a very grassroots level. Um, from this case study, I want to highlight the problems that the Chinese Museum is facing, and uh, want to, I want to say that there are a lack of publishing interest at my institution, and I hope to find a way uh, towards a publishing culture for the museum in the future. platform challenges from the two journal. As a co-editor, I have uh, two of my co um, editorial team today here, Penny Tan and Joanne, also my co-editor, and we have another one who is not here today, Ben Rayford. So, um, let me start. Uh, Bratu is a journal of Buddhist and Hindu architecture and archaeology of ancient to pre-modern Southeast Asia. It's published in 2017. Uh, the journal is funded by Southeast Asian Academic Program, or we you know as SAP. It was formed and is run by a group of SOAS PhD students, together with advisory members of SAP Research and Publication Committee. FATU aims to be a platform for young scholars and early career research, both Western and non-Western, to publish their work on the ancient to pre-modern Buddhist and Hindu visual and material culture of Southeast Asia. Peer review is included in our publishing process, although our journal is published in English language, but we accept articles within the, the Southeast Asian languages and we offer English translation published parallel with the original text as well. Uh, for some of you, 
who is interested in publishing your article with us, please visit our website or see more details here, pretojournal.org, or you can get our paper here. And this is our website. You can go and then see some more details of mission. And this is advertising time, sorry. And uh, yeah. there are several issues that we have been discussing and facing since we set up the journal. This is, uh, we think this is because the journal is published in multiple languages. So we consider um, the, the challenge it as um, because we challenge with the different academic cultures. So some of you who is international student, you might know this, um, these issues on the screen. I have listed our considered to comparing between Western and non-Western or Southeast Asian academic cultures. In the case, we have the Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam and Thai for, for the case. Uh, these issues on the screen are <coughs> not new, and as an international student in the UK University, the first thing that we have to learn in the precessional course is about all of this. Uh, writing style here, writing style in Paria, is clearly seen that Western culture that we have been taught that a good article has to be well structured, like you have to start from A to B to C to D, and you have uh, having an argument in your article and critical examining. However, compared to Southeast Asian um, culture, especially Thai and Vietnam that we have discussed, no structure is required in our article. And some articles start from the result, and sometimes the end might be end with something general idea, not the conclusion that you expect. And uh, no argument is required as well. And for author, most of the author in Southeast Asia, we are why to criticize author, especially their teachers or colleagues, because being criticized means <coughs> being disrespectful or aggressive person. This is kind of a culture that intertwined to your academic writing. And reference uh, the next issue is a uh, highly concern in the Western academic culture. This includes um, reference citation system, crediting source, why in Southeast Asia, um, sometimes this issue is less attention. And there is also some limitation that Noel and Pip has mentioned before about uh, in Western, the reference is restricted by data access in which new discoveries published in Southeast Asian languages might not be acknowledged or noticed by Western scholars who cannot read Southeast Asian language. And on the other hand, Southeast Asian scholars are indeed restricted by language barrier and also data and publication access, such as expensive database, e-journal, and book, and etc. And the last issue is copyright, which is similar to the reference. And uh, I come up with the idea from uh, when we start to, to think about set up our process, publishing process, then we think of dealing with the different academic cultures, therefore bring us to face with some challenges when we start up our publishing process. And the first topic, first issue is the peer review and different academic, academic cultures. The second is the role of the editor and editorial team. So I will just describe this uh, issue through the charts on this slide. The first, uh, the first chart on the, uh, at the top is um, the normal process for English article written by Western or, or English speaker scholar. The article will be passed from our editor team to reviewer and editor will work with the author when comments come back and finally publish. This is a normal for other um, journal as well. But the second is uh, a process for Southeast Asian article which um, the first, which are written by Southeast Asian scholar. And uh, in this case, the first challenge for us is that the order, uh, in order to accept the article, at least one of our editorial team must be able to read that language. So we then apply to one of our co-editor. At the moment, we have uh, two English speakers, one Vietnamese and one Thai speaker in our editorial team. So we have planned that in the future we might have an option for the guest editor if we receive another Southeast Asian language. Yeah. And the second challenge for the second step, the reviewer, the same, similar. Uh, the reviewer has to be able to read that language as well. So we have to list uh, the reviewer in the region or so of the scholar who can read that 
it's not necessary to be only the Southeast Asian scholar. It can be a Western scholar who can read that, that language too. And in this way, sometimes we have uh, editor, reviewer, and author are from the same language, our same academic cultures. So we have one case, if we already have one case, if all of the, um, the author, the, the editor, and the reviewer are from the same country. However, we have to keep in mind that in the end, the paper will be published in English. And, uh, and therefore, although most of the publishing process run by these uh, Southeast Asian scholars, the paper should be made sense for our reader, who is mostly familiar with the Western academic culture. And this is crucial challenges for our co-editor, because the editorial team will be able to review the article only after the translating process done. So it's nearly here. So all of this process is being done by you know, like one co-editor who knows that language well. And sometimes we, we, have, we have been discussed like, uh, how can we evaluate this is to uh, reach our, um, our theme or our question for the, the journal before we translate. And however, in some case, we have paper submitted in English language, but the author is Southeast Asian background why the reviewers are a Western scholar. Therefore, sometimes comments are derived from different academic culture or different sources or different um, um, differences resulted in difficulty to respond for the author, from the author for, uh, for the comments. Uh, in this case, our co-editor has to closely cooperate with author to respond to comments. So in this case, we, we, we have a we have um, our question in our editorial team, like how, how far the co-editor can be in touch with the author to respond to the comments. Because uh, usually when you are an editor, you, are, you should not in touch to, to, to help your the to, to, to author to, to respond to, to the comments, right? And, and, and uh, in addition of voice, for us, uh, we have discussed about whether the local name should be tran transliterated or translated, or shall we put them together in the reference? This is just only a um, small, small thing that we have been discussed. And another thing is about the author's name in the, uh, is another point that we uh, recently have uh, this issue come across. Uh, and uh, the author name is, uh, you can see on your program <coughs> right now, that we, uh, in, the, in this case, we have Cambodian name, which Ashley Thompson suggested that generally the surname will come first and followed by name, and but but someone the West uh, some, somehow the Western system converts the name of the Cambodian to like a name and a surname, and this is a very small small thing that we are uh, thinking about like uh, to respect the the culture, and finally the issue about in-text citation, in case from Thailand uh, in the in-text citation system. Generally, we recognize pe people by name, but uh, when citing the author in, in the text. Uh, in Western system, we have to use surname and then following by year, right? And some scholars in Thailand suggested, why don't we just put the name and then following by year, like this. See, Sakwali Podom is one author, and then uh, if he published in 2000, so suggest it's a C Sak 2000, not Bali Podom 2000. So this is just a very small, small thing about the reference that we we are consider on that. And, uh, and for me, I think the publishing process for the journal is a learning and developing process between editorial team and the Southeast Asian scholars, and also amongst our editorial team as well, ourselves, to decolonize the production of knowledge of Southeast Asia, art and archaeology from the publishing platform. Although we are still struggling to achieve this colonizing goal that at least we think we have started and be aware, aware of some of the issues that come up. Thank you for <laughs>
thing with the, the museum, the problems you were talking about with your institution and the, not having uh, access to resources which are there, let's say the EFU or other uh, institutions. So I, I think from our experience, what we try to do is just, it seems to me that the resources are there, it's just a question of pulling them together under the same thing. So for example, when you're saying we don't have these pictures or these journals, you said they are there at the EFU in Paris. Um, so in Pondicherry also, there is an EFU there, there is an Institut Francais there. You mentioned a lot of translation problems. So a lot of ways how we got around to our problems was just try and work together with the people and the resources uh, there to take care of translation problems or share more resource uh, data amongst each other. So I was wondering if that's something you could try and get more people together rather than saying, okay, we don't have this in our institution, but if you can share these things amongst each other. Yeah, I agree. Actually, that's what I'm very, I'm trying to do right now. Um, because I, I I have been working at the museum for more than 10 years. Um, now I'm still in contract there. So uh, while I'm outside Vietnam, I see a lot of resources uh, related to Shamba. Yeah. Uh, but I don't see it at the museum. Yeah. So actually, I'm not willing to say, oh, we don't have this, we don't have that, and then we stop at that. Yeah. I mentioned we don't have that because I want to find a way out of that situation. Yeah. So that's why I'm thinking of like cooperating with uh, other partners to build a link. Yeah. Or at least to work with EFL in the future to help to bring some sorts of materials back to the museum for future research. Thanks. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the panel. I thought it was an excellent overview of the issues uh, faced by Western scholars and Southeast Asian scholars and engaging each other's work. And it's definitely been my experience uh, working on Thailand and looking at Thai scholars' work and, and Western scholars' work. Um, what, I, what I'm interested in is if, if there's been any work on the history of how these um, academic cultures diverge through time. So for instance, uh, I think the example that jumps out would be Zuyen's example of Zuyen that was suddenly, uh, from, what I, from what I understand, it lost all its archives at some point, and therefore deprived the museum of an important resource for its ongoing work. And I have a feeling that's probably the case with many other colonial uh, era uh, museums in other parts of the world, that uh, the museum is there, but much of what um, what, what would have contributed to its growth was taken away during, at some point in history. Um, I don't know if anyone can answer about the history of their academic culture, but maybe we start with Zhu Yan, if, if you can tell us how the AFAO records uh, and photos uh, were removed from the museum. Mm. Yeah, actually, um, I don't know uh, when, but uh, um, a few weeks ago when I was in Vietnam, I talked with uh, John Di Phuong, a very famous architect in Vietnam, and he mentioned like uh, during the colonial period, the museum had a library with some sorts written in French. And I, 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 I wonder if at, back to that time they had this kind of photographic archive. Uh, but actually today, on photo, uh, I mean on the photos of the ancient Cham temples uh, on the statue at Eiffel, yeah. So at the, some national uh, center, I mean, in Vietnam, we have some uh, archival center, but we only have limited uh, numbers of photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, the majority is still now in, in the felt archive, and the Guimé Museum also have um, um, a set of reproductions. Uh, yeah, and they said they got permission from Eiffel to have all of the reproductions. Yeah, um, yeah, so, um, uh, uh, I don't know why, how, how and when the, uh, this happened in Vietnam, but uh, when I worked at the History Museum in Hanoi and in Saigon, I saw that the history in Hanoi and in Saigon still have some uh, written documents, like excavation report, for example, the excavation, the Mitsan excavation or the Dongyu excavation. They are really important, and the reports are also really important. And the History Museum in Saigon, or we say Ho Chi Minh City officially, 
So the History Museum in Ho Chi Minh City had the report, and the librarian told me that when Ifo, actually you know the history of Ifo, so Ifo moved around to Vietnam. So after 1945, Ifo shifting back to to uh, Paris, yeah, and they moved on the documents to Paris Center, yeah. But somehow these uh, four excavation uh, uh, reports left in Saigon. Yeah, in Ho Chi Minh City. So today, some researcher, if they want to know more about the French uh, excavation at Dong Yu or at Mission, they still go to the Ho Chi Minh City. But they only have this kind of documents and all the other kept in the carton, uh, I mean, on the boxes at the Eiffel. So I think uh, the documents have been moved to Paris in that time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for these very good presentations. I have a, a question related to publications. Two of the presentations dealt with that. Uh, one is about cost. You mentioned that there are publications in English and in Thai, for example. How accessible are the publications in Thai for Thai students, for example? And is there any other way for people to access this publication? Not only talking about the Thai now, but also the foreign language publications, especially the key text that you did mention some of these um, seminal books that you mentioned on archaeology and art history. Are there any kinds of um, issues with copyright in Cambodia, for example, where I used to work? Some of these books were just taken to the Russian market and photocopied. Uh, for me, I mean, for some of the people in my organization, it was an issue, but at the end of the day, if it enables more people to access this text, I didn't think that it was so much of an issue. And the other point I wanted to make is that the Association for Asian Studies for which I work also has some funding for the translation of books in the vernacular language into English. So if you have some good ideas of books that you think would really help promote the scholarship of Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, or Cambodia, please let us know because there's some funding. Usually the translation is always from Southeast Asian language to English. But it really sort of helped. The, the funding is not massive, but the initiative I think is very important. Um, uh, in, in Thailand, uh, the situation of uh, translation of publication, I think uh, every uh, uh, university uh, tried to encourage uh, their uh, lecturers or researchers to uh, translate uh, English or uh, other uh, languages uh, into uh, Thai and uh, try to uh, encourage uh, Thai scholar to uh, publish uh, their work in English. Um, but I'm not sure what happened. Because, okay, uh, you will see, uh, give, uh, I'm not sure, a lot of uh, money uh, for translation. But uh, finally, maybe, like, uh, there is no a lot of uh, pressure, uh, you know, uh, to 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 uh, to uh, transfer uh, like uh, uh, academia academic uh, work. So uh, yeah, we we uh, for example uh, in my uh, my faculty is uh, the faculty of uh, development. Uh, we have a scholarship. We have uh, money like uh, a college. Uh, our uh, staff uh, to do that, but um, the system or uh, like uh, uh, something that uh, that doesn't work. Uh, um, few people have uh, the passion uh, to uh, trans translate uh, English or a uh, uh, local language to English and uh, go to a uh, prison. Um, uh, they are prefer in English. Like uh, um, I know uh, in my faculty uh, we have uh, two hundred fifty uh, lecturers, but uh, each year. Just allow uh, five or six uh, go to board and work uh, send uh, their paper in English. And uh, another point that uh, you uh, asked me about, like um, uh, the copyright. Um, uh, the copyright uh, law in, in Thailand, I'm not sure, uh, is quite uh, strict. So, um, it's a different uh, from uh, Cambodia, like uh, when you uh, travel in uh, Gaul, uh, like a student uh, come to you and then uh, try to sell a um, book uh, from a real book, like 
actually it's a chemical uh, uh, copy, right? Uh, but in Thailand, we, 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 we don't have a, that uh, situation. Maybe because um, the price of a uh, book uh, quite uh, cheaper uh, than uh, Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in uh, publishing a company, they uh, try to uh, open uh, the new market uh, by uh, using uh, like an uh, online uh, bookshop. So you can uh, access uh, easily um, uh, all the books that, that, that you need. And I think uh, uh, Google uh, has a uh, quite uh, useful uh, for uh, access uh, many uh, uh, Southeast Asian languages. And um, in Thailand, uh, for example, my faculty, we uh, teach a lot of five uh, Southeast Asian uh, languages, uh, Khmer, Bahasa, Indonesia, uh, and uh, other. And we, now uh, we try uh, to uh, encourage uh, our staff and uh, students uh, to uh, study uh, the math uh, book and article uh, in uh, Southeast Asian language. Uh, and we have like a, uh, the regulation that uh, uh, the fourth year of a, uh, a student they have to do uh, I mean uh, in uh, in Southeast Asian uh, program student they have to use a uh, local or uh, Southeast Asian uh, language to do uh, his uh, thesis or uh, research before they uh, graduate. Mm -hmm. May I ask some, or may I um, add something? I think like. Um, in terms of uh, Thai journal, for Silapakon journal and Damrong uh, Vishakan journal, in the university journal, mostly they are free. Uh, they has a free copy that you can read online. This is an e-book that you cannot download. That. You can access by internet, but you have to know Thai language. Then you can access and you can read it, but you cannot download. Yeah. Mm, and uh, mostly Thai university, yeah, we, uh, we offer the, a free copy. Yeah, all, all the journal in, in, in Thailand. In university? Yeah, they, yeah in university. Uh, they, uh, uh, open uh, free uh, access uh, for uh, everyone, and some uh, most of the uh, uh, journal we have uh, like a text, uh, English uh, text. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for another question? Okay. Thank you very much for all the time.